The Golden Bowl by Marjorie Cowley. Read by Brian Henderson. This video is meant for education purposes only. All rights reserved to the author and publishers. Chapter 4 On Their Way. Too numb to talk, they walked along the sandy road in silence. The sky grew brighter, then the edge of the sun appeared on the flat horizon. Gradually, the cool of the night disappeared as the blazing circle rose slowly in the sky. The heat increased until it became so intense that Jomar thought he could see rays of sunlight shimmering in front of him. Jomar walked beside his father, who was holding Zepha's hand. Without warning, Darabi swayed, then pitched forward. In an instant, Zepha was down beside him, cradling her father's head in her lap. Jomar knelt down and spoke quietly. Father, you're too weak to make this journey. I know you wanted to be sure we took the right road, but I can find it from your description. Stay here until you feel stronger, then go back to the farm. Darabi raised himself to a sitting position and started to protest, then sank down again. I wanted to take you to the city, and now I'm unable to take you to the road that leads to the city. Go on without me. You must be an Ur before nightfall. They helped their father settle under an almost leafless tree that offered a bit of shade. Darabi pressed Zepha to his chest, his hand smoothing her hair. He looked at Jomar with teary eyes. You must have better sandals. Mine are newer. Take them and give me yours. After the exchange was made, he reached up and embraced Jomar. I know Zepha will be in good hands. Aware their father was watching them, Jomar and Zepha started off at a rapid pace. But when the road curved and they knew Darabi could no longer see them, Zepha's steps began to falter. She fell farther and farther behind. Jomar stopped. Try to go faster, he called back to her. I'll wait for you. Not fair, Zepha shouted back. While you wait, you'll be resting. If you keep up with me, we can rest together, Jomar yelled. I'm hungry and tired of walking, Zepha said as she reached him. Jomar sighed and pointed to some yellowing tamarsk trees growing close to a reservoir some distance ahead. Maybe there is a swallow of drinking water there. Anyway, we need to get out of the sun for a while but the reservoir held just a rubble of rocks, silty dried mud, and a trickle of stagnant water. Kicking off their sandals, they sank to the ground under the meager shade of the trees. Jomar opened his basket. Only a small clay bowl, a handful of dates, and four small shrunken pomegranates. Zeppa wrinkled her nose. They look like dried up pieces of leather. Jomar said nothing. Removing the top of the bowl, he found a thick porridge made of boiled emmer, the wheat they grew to feed the animals. This'll fill us up. But it's tasteless, Zepha said. That's all I have, Jomar said sharply. What's in yours? Zepha took a woven pouch from her basket and untied its reed string. She showed Jomar a small mixture of almonds and hard raisins. Searching deeper, she found a boiled egg still in its shell and held it up as if it were a carved ivory treasure. Mother gave me the last one, she said tearily. Their mother was right. Zepha's spirit was gone indeed. Mothers knew how to help, but what could a brother do to make his sister strong? Jomar could only think of one thing. Eat. She looked lovingly at the egg, then stuffed more than half of it into her mouth. Share the food, Jomar said. Zepha began weeping. You told me to eat. All right, I did, Jomar said. We'll divide the egg and dates between us, and save the rest for the long walk ahead of us. Zepha raised her chin. Why are you the one who makes all the decisions? I'm in charge because I'm older than you, Jomar answered. Zepha shook her head angrily. You've gone from ignoring me to ordering me around. It's a job I don't want. Don't try to make me feel sorry for you, Zepha's tone changed. I'll give you what's left of the egg for one of your dates. Exasperated. He handed her a shriveled date. I wish it was a syrupy one that mother saved to make into honey. You know they were gone a long time ago. Jomar looked at Zeppa, thin and miserable. His eye fell on her basket. The liar was inside. Sing a song for me. He felt his cheeks flush. The one you were singing in the goat hutch then when I made you stop. Zeppa's eyes widened in surprise. She swallowed the date her face brightening as she brought out her lyre. She began to sing with her head tilted back, 
her eyes closed. Moon glowing Nana, all knowing Nana, look down from the heavens and pity us, born only to serve you. Comfort us, born only to serve you. Moon glowing Nana, all knowing Nana, look down from the heavens and pity us. Comfort us, weep for us. Your tears will water our wasted land. Jomar chewed his bit of egg slowly as he listened to her soaring song. For years, he'd heard the songs that Zephyr made up, heard them without really listening. They had been about such childish things as a lost doll, the death of a pig, and the sun's magic that shriveled a grape into a sweet raisin. But now, Jomar was struck by the words of this song. How could a girl of twelve make up such a solemn prayer? As Zephyr was repeating the last line of her song, Rustling sounds behind him made Jomar wheel around. A dozen men stood gazing at Zephyr with rapt expressions. He had no idea how long they'd been there. Chapter 5 A Good Voice Jomar sprang to his feet and stood over Zephyr, his hand gripping her shoulder. Zephyr stopped singing, opened her eyes, and saw the group gathered in front of them. She looked up at Jomar with alarm. A tall, heavy-set man stepped forward. His fine linen garment stretched tight across his large belly. The man behind him wore frayed sandals and rough cotton tunics that hung loosely on the thin frames. All carried knives attached to their belts, and digging tools rested on their shoulders. Gesturing toward Zephyr, the stout man spoke to Jomar. A good voice, a good musician, surprising for one so young. Jomar tried not to show his fear or anger. Hadn't he urged Zephyr to leave her liar behind? This man who spoke with such easy authority could only cause trouble. Why are you two on the road alone? The man emphasized the last word of his question. I go to Ur to be an apprentice to Sita, a temple goldsmith, Jomar said. The man studied Zephyr with calculating eyes. And the little liar player? What will she do? I'll find work for her, Jomar said. The man shook his head. That'll be hard to do in the city, but there's work to be done here. I'm Malik, sent by the temple to patrol the irrigation system and see that it's clear of rubble. He glared at the men. The moon god is displeased with you farmers for letting the canals and reservoirs fill with rocks, dead plants, and silt. You've forgotten that you live and work on land that is owned by Nana's temple. The sullen men were silent until one spoke out. We've kept the waterways clear in the past, but the long drought has made us lose hope. Malik turned to Jomar. These farmers have no faith that the moon god will eventually provide for his people. Soon you'll be a man, so you must join my crew. I can't. The goldsmith waits for me, Jomar said. But when the drought is over and I return to our farm, I'll gladly join your work crew. Malik snorted. When you return, it's the custom that an apprentice can leave only if he's been poorly taught. Jomar was stunned. Raised in the country, he knew nothing of the city rules that govern craftsmen and their apprentices. Malik dipped his head in mock courtesy. Be on your way to this man who works with glorious gold. The girl will stay to help with meals and keep up the spirits of the men with her music. You can't separate us, Jomar's hand tightened on Zephyr's shoulder. She's my sister. Ah, but I can, Malik said. I'm a temple official with the authority to enslave any child found wandering far from home without a parent. But she has parents, Jomar cried out. Malik slowly looked around. I do not see them. He turned to Zephyr. You're thin. You'll be well fed in return for your work. Jomar felt weak. With an effort, he pulled his eyes away from Malik and looked at the other men. Most seemed sympathetic, but a few looked more entertained than concerned. Two men with their heads thrust forward towards Zephyr frightened him. I'll join your workforce, Jomar said quietly. He felt Zephyr's shoulder sag with relief under his grip. A thin smile played on Malik's lips. You will receive Nana's blessings for your effort. 
the smirk disappeared. I've wasted enough time with the two of you. Girl, see that old man stirring the pot? Help him prepare the evening meal. Jomar bent down to whisper a promise of protection to Zephyr. Words he knew would be difficult for him to uphold. Malik's hand cut the air. Leave her! There's work to be done. Chapter 6 Trapped Malik took the lead, heading off with short, fast steps. But under the scorching sun, his pace soon slowed and his bald head gleamed with sweat. The silent men walked behind Malik in a haze of dust and dirt scuffed up by their feet. Jomar, near the end of the line, had grit in his eyes, his mouth, his nose. We were next to a reservoir that needed work, Jomar said quietly to the man nearest to him. Why are we leaving? The man looked straight ahead. First, we must clear a canal some distance away. He pointed his chin at Malik. When we're close to exhaustion, he'll have us return to clean out the reservoir before he lets us eat or sleep. He's cruel, Jomar said. The man shrugged. Cruel and clever. He knows how to get work out of the farmers. If their labor pleases him, they'll have a good meal and all the beer they can drink tonight. You sound like you've done this kind of thing before, Jomar said. Many times for many years, the man said. I'm Kat Nu, a temple slave assigned to travel the farmlands with Malik. He turned slightly so that his bare back, covered with welts and jagged scars, could be seen by Jomar. Marks of his displeasure. Horrified, Jomar stared at Katnu's back. Katnu looked at Jomar with a sorrowful expression on his wrinkled, sunburned face. I pity your young sister. Both of you must do your work well and give Malik no cause for anger. I'll leave your side because it will go poorly for me if he sees me talking with you. Katnu lost himself among the other men. The crew came to a halt at the bank of a debris-filled canal that had once carried water to neighboring fields. Remove the loose rocks from the canal and put them on the banks, Malik ordered. Shovel out the silt and spread it on the ground. Rebuild the collapsed banks with rocks to hold the water that will someday return. He settled under a yellowing palm tree, the only shady spot in the parched field. Soon, his eyes were half closed. The work called for no special skill, only endurance. Without a shovel to remove the cake mud, Jomar collected and stacked the rocks that the others heaved out of the canal. The hot, dusty day wore on. The ache in Jomar's back gradually increased, and his hand became covered with cuts from the sharp, jagged rocks he handled. He listened to a steady, soft rumble of complaints from the men who worked close to him. What right do they have to take us from our farms? Let slaves do this work. I treat my animals better than he treats us. My mouth feels like a desert. I need something to drink. Only Cat knew was silent. Jomar guessed that his slave had no right to complain. To avoid Malik's anger, Jomar stayed as silent as the slave. After the canal had been cleared, Cat knew woke Malik, who had been sleeping with his head lolling to one side. Malik rubbed his eyes and lurched to his feet. Your tasks here are finished, Malik barked while tugging at a small silver flask that hung from his belt. We return now to clear the reservoir. When he put the flask to his lips and drank, there was angry muttering. See that the work is finished before the sun disappears, he said. Tomorrow you'll repair the other canals that you farmers have ignored. Tomorrow? They had expected to be in the city tonight. They were trapped, unable to escape Malik's powerful hold on them both.